anatomy of a fall. Am I saying that right? Is it anatomy of a fall or is it anatomy of a fall? Anatomy of a fall. Anatomy of a fall. Anatomy of a fall. It's a movie about two things. First, an event, the fall. Second, a process, the anatomy. Anatomy is the dissection of the fall, how we come to understand it. It's not just a movie about an event, but how we deal with and come to conclusions about that event. Got it? I also just like the title's format, blank of a blank. It's inexplicably pairing these two things together, anatomies and falls, from the start. It's in the title. And this is an idea that continues throughout the entire movie. Pairs shape the way we view this story. The central pair is a couple, Sandra and Samwell. It's a courtroom drama, so there's a prosecution and a defense, and both sides need to amplify some details while negating others in order to make their own best case. So there's a question of what is actually the truth and what is more bias. And all the while, the true reality of Sandra and Samwell's relationship together cannot be fully represented in this binary format that the trial requires. Sometimes a couple is kind of a chaos. Anatomy of a Fall goes like this. One morning at her home in the French countryside, Sandra, an established author, is being interviewed by a literature student. Her husband Samuel is a teacher, although also hoping to publish a work of fiction someday, and during the interview he's upstairs renovating their third floor when he starts to play very loud music. Sandra, seemingly used to this behavior, doesn't confront it, just lets it continue, which effectively puts the interview to an end. A student leaves, Sandra goes to their second floor to work, and their visually impaired son Daniel leaves to walk the dog Snoop. Daniel is visually impaired because of an accident that happened a few years prior. Some was supposed to pick him up from school, but he was in a real writing spell. I think he had what they call writer's itch. So he sent a babysitter to pick up Daniel instead, and they were in a rush, and while crossing the street, Daniel was hit by a car which permanently damaged his vision. So that's why that is the way it is. When Daniel and Snoop return from their walk, they find Samuel on the ground, not breathing. Daniel calls for his mother, seemingly unaware of what's happened, and she calls the police. Under an investigation, it is ruled out that the fall was accidental, so it was either deliberate on Samuel's part, as in he committed suicide, or deliberate on Sandra's, as in she hit him on the head and pushed him out the window. Case goes to trial and several aspects of their marriage are heavily scrutinized and in front of their son, whose image of his father, Sandra, has always tried to protect. Can we please keep that clean? Vincent, I would really like to protect him and his image and spare Daniel. Daniel must deal with conflicting emotions about both his parents during the testimony as some information comes to light about his father's previous suicide attempt six months prior, and then just generally needing to reckon with his mother potentially being a murderer. When Daniel realizes that the circumstances of the previous suicide attempt align with details he had overlooked on the day of the fall, he testifies as the sole witness that he believes his father must have committed suicide. This is the version of reality that makes the most sense to Daniel, so even if the nature of the fall will never be able to eliminate all doubt, he decides this must be true. Sandra is found innocent and they all go home. Is the French court system, I don't know what to tell you. But the question remains, did she do it? Throughout the film, there are two interpretations that are plausible in this universe. It's consistent in its ambiguity. The way Sandra behaves, the way she is framed, we are not told explicitly what to think of her. In one interpretation, you could see Sandra as the spiteful wife, Samwell ruining the interview on the morning of his death as just the final straw in a long chain of events involving the accident that Dan damaged his son's eyesight, financial struggles, and him convincing Sandra to move back to his home country after saying it will solve all their problems, which it obviously didn't. The culmination of all this becomes too much, and so Sandra takes his life in an act of desperation and revenge. The answer to the question, did she do it, becomes absolutely she did, and she'd do it again. But this interpretation of Sandra does not resonate with me. <laughs> it's not how I made sense of this movie, seeing everything she goes through, what standards and expectations we impose on to her and how we expect women to behave, especially going through something like this. Anatomy of a Fall is like a choose your own adventure, except every path you can go down leads to your husband's demise, which, you know, depending on if you're the killer or not, makes a big difference. You could go down one path and huzzah, you're not the killer, but your husband still isn't here anymore. It's the exact same result as going down the diabolical evil path, but maybe not as fun. At the end of all this, after being acquitted, it doesn't really feel like a victory for Sandra and for her son too. He's watching his mom leave the court for the last time on TV and he's like halfway between laughing and crying because it's great that his mom isn't a murderer but he's still got to deal with the same sad result at the end of all this. He's still got to deal with that. 
The framework that this movie presents in excavating, dissecting, nitpicking, scrutinizing, ripping to shreds, tearing to pieces this couple is a courtroom drama. The courtroom, the place where nuance cannot exist. Donc, il s'agit de, de, de croire ou de ne pas croire. C'est une opinion subjective. In a way, I see Anatomy of a Fall consistent with 2019's Marriage Story, which has nightmares about this movie, according to one Letterboxd user. In Marriage Story, Charlie and Nicole are going through a divorce and are forced to amplify the worst parts of their relationship in order to argue their side. They had hoped at the beginning that it wouldn't come to that, but it's kind of inevitable once they start funneling their entire marriage and life together through the lens of the court system. And while the process of divorce is ongoing, the people around them must pick sides. As a result, Charlie is unable to do Halloween with Nicole and her family. I'll take Cassie Sam. and Sam are mad. Mad at who? You. Cassie and Sam? You can understand that, so I think we should probably do separate Halloweens. But if you're okay with it, then shouldn't they be okay with it? Let's just do it this way this time. Do you not want me there? But once they are officially and forever divorced, meaning that the process of it is over and now it is just a legally backed relationship status change, they no longer have to behave as if their relationship exists in absolutes because it doesn't. No more I'm all good, my partner is all bad. They can co-parent knowing it's more nuanced than that, so the final scene of the movie is Charlie and Nicole and her family doing Halloween together. The process is over, we don't have to pretend we were as bad as we argued in front of all those legal people. There's no more taking sides, it's just life. Likewise, in Anatomy of a Fall, the defense and prosecution have to take all the intricacies out of reality, highlight facts that speak to their argument in order to adopt a more absolute view of Sandra's marriage. And you won't be surprised to find out that reducing her life in this way results in neither side fully resonating to her. I'm not that monster, you know? Everything you hear in the trial is twisted. I mean, I don't know if she was ever going to fully resonate with the murder side, but even when it's her own defense lawyer arguing her innocence... Ce qui a marqué les derniers mois de de la vie de cet homme, c'est pas une guerre dans son couple. C'est le constat d'une faillite personnelle. Rooting the fall in Samuel being unable to deal with the culmination of his personal failings, she makes a point to reject this interpretation. There was not That's her response to the key argument to convince the jury that she didn't murder her husband. There was not I don't know, if it were me, I don't know if I would have made a comment that, had it been heard by the jury, would have undermined the entire defensive strategy. I would have been like, yeah, yeah, what he said. But the film shows things in this way to highlight that Sandra doesn't believe in absolutes, so she's not really arguing for herself, but arguing for others to see her, Samuel, and then them together in a more nuanced way. When Samuel's therapist testifies, he speaks as if there is a reality where Sandra is all bad and Samuel is the sole victim. En train de vous retirer de l'équation alors que vous êtes au centre de l'équation. En fait, c'est ce yo-yo émotionnel dans lequel il était. Euh... I'm sorry. But you, you come here, okay, with your, maybe your opinion. Opinion. See also his version of reality. But what you say is just a, a little part of the whole situation. If I'd been seeing a therapist, he could stand here too and say very ugly things about Samuel, but would those things be true? Yes, parts of what he says are true in Samuel's reality, but they were not true in Sandra's or the life that they experienced together, so they are not absolutely true, and Sandra makes sure to articulate that. Reality is contradictory in this way. Something that may be true in our sphere, in our headspace, is not true through the perspective of someone else. Realities can be true locally, but not globally. And then also, reality is what we remember it to be, so even our version version of it is time-dependent and deeply subjective. The title sequence at the beginning of the film depicts early realities of Sandra and Samuel through photos, stuck in time, that paint a mostly positive picture. Or at least looking at them first glance, there isn't anything outwardly odd or nefarious. Except maybe some of these haircuts! And then towards the end of the movie, when Daniel is making his own conclusions about the case, he's looking at these photos, but it's different. Like him, we also know more now. They're not just a happy married couple. They've transformed into something that was perhaps happy at times, yes, but as we come to learn through the recording and just the entire trial process, also spiteful and at least once very mean. With hindsight, the details of each photo may mean something different than what they once did. A shadow isn't just a shadow anymore. A shadow can come to represent their entire dynamic as a couple. Like them, the details transform. She is a clear person, but his being casts a partial darkness onto her while he is entirely out of focus. Samuel's inability to focus casts a darkness onto others. Am I going too far? Is this making sense? Am I coming in clear? Am I coming in clear? 
Without overanalyzing, the usage of photos suggests some transformation has occurred from a reality that is now past. Is this trial just about one fall or about several fallings out over the course of their marriage? A retrospective, how did we get here sort of situation. When Sandra is practicing her testimony at home, she describes Samuel when they first met as charming, how he could change the atmosphere in a room. I don't doubt he'd lost this ability, but when you first meet someone, everything is very exciting and interesting. And so perhaps this quality, like their reality together, had morphed into something more riddled with his own insecurities. I see the first scene of him playing loud music as a very literal representation of him being able to change the atmosphere in a room. It's not really possible anymore, is it? Comment vous avez interprété euh, la chanson diffusée par euh, Samuel Maleski J'ai senti un sous-texte tendu vu le bruit et aussi la présence de Monsieur Maleski qui se manifeste comme ça d'un coup sans le voir. Him playing the music is consistent perhaps with how he's always behaved, but the motivation has changed. It's no longer to charm people, but as a cry for help, a cry to be noticed. Maybe the worst parts of him can't coexist with Sandra's success. I mean, people are coming into their home because they're interested in her work, who want to interview her and pick her brain. He could view this as a personal affront because of his own insecurities and feelings of failure, but it really has nothing to do with him. If Sandra Voiter is culpable of something, in reality, it's to have succeeded where her marriage has failed. Maybe that's the thing he can't deal with, is that it has nothing to do with him. His therapist, who apparently knew what he meant word for word with total clarity, described Sandra's behavior after Daniel's accident as castrating to Samwell, that she made him pay for what happened and as a result he couldn't write anymore. Sandra admits in court to resenting Samwell after their son's accident, but not because of what had actually happened, but because of Samwell's attitude afterwards, how he chose to deal with it. The, the doctor earlier said something about a, a tragic situation. I I immediately refused to see it that way. I never saw Daniel as handicapped. I wanted to protect him from that perception. So perhaps I resented someone for projecting his own pain onto Daniel. Is there something to be said about how this is an accident that took away most of his son's eyesight? And we also know that Samuel is a person who plays very loud music in order to work. So like the initial thing took away his eyesight, but then the behavior later takes away his hearing, his ability to hear things coherently in the house. We know that on the day of Samuel's death, Daniel left the house in order to escape the loud music. Like Samuel needing to do these things in order to work are more inhibiting to Daniel than the accident that he really blames himself for. And then during the trial, the film shows Daniel getting exponentially better at piano, like he's gotten one of his senses back. I don't want to sound insensitive by pointing this out, but I feel like the film intentionally shows this progression. It's just a byproduct of his father not being in the space anymore. But but I'm sure that Daniel would rather have his parent back than be gaining a new skill. And again, I say all this, but this is my interpretation. This is my speculation. This is a movie about creating a reality that resonates the most with how you see things. Is Sandra a murder wife or just a woman wife? Hmm? It's like how the two recent Elvis Presley movies, Elvis 2022 and Priscilla 2023, both reenact wedding photos, but choosing to depict two different moments of the same event. It's the same story, but two different sides. And then it's as if each of those photos, those singular moments were extrapolated out and became the thesis statement of the couple's characterization in each film. It would be great if we had something here to extrapolate out in order to make sense of Samuel Molesky's death. Oh no, wait, we do. We have this fight. The emotional climax of the trial comes when a recording of the couple is shared. The day before his death, Sandra and Samuel had an explosive argument that started with him expressing his desire to have more time to write. This argument was shared in court because there was a recording of it and there was a recording of it because Samuel recorded it. Right. Right. Sandra says that she knew he often recorded things in order to get inspiration for material, but she was not privy to this particular instance and admits that she thinks he might have provoked this argument just for the sake of recording it. So we don't know and we'll never know Samuel's intentions, what this conversation really meant to him. There's no doubt, however, that he's amplified the worst parts of their relationship on purpose. It's an argument. People exaggerate and alter facts when they argue. I mean, it wouldn't have worked as an argument if it didn't come from a truthful, meaningful place. Like, if he had suddenly taken a huge stand on her not refilling the Brita, I don't think it would have elicited the same response as this. You are not a victim! Not at all! And because we're in a court of law, this recording becomes a huge point for how they are characterized as a couple and how we characterize Sandra as a person. In it, Sandra reacts emphatically, which could be seen as her taking a stand against the issues that Samwell brings up, or it could lean into the more cruel interpretation of her character 
sure her response is taken as totally apathetic in the face of a man who's asking for a change. The recording doesn't do her a ton of favors, and for some reason there is not another recording out there relevant to this trial that is shared and could show another angle of their relationship, would you believe it? En dehors de cette gifle vous concédez, est-ce que vous aviez déjà frappé votre mari? Non. C'était la seule fois. Oui. Vous avez toujours été en toutes circonstances cette bonne âme admirable, sauf au moment de cet enregistrement, c'est pas de chance. Not to mention, it's already hard to characterize Sandra in the midst of all this. I mean, for one thing, Sandra is a woman. I know. But we hate women. Not just that, but she's a complicated woman. What? We especially don't know how to deal with that. I actually don't think it matters how complex she is. They'll always find something wrong. There's something about being a woman that's just always losing. Like that movie that came out last year about the most stereotypical woman of them all and some people watched it like, not enough, not complicated enough for me. I don't get it, she has basic needs? Good art mustn't always be complicated, sometimes it really is just cellulite and death, cellulite and death. Maybe Barbie wasn't trying to change your worldview, but just make sure everybody else was caught up. If Barbie didn't do it for you, watch Anatomy of a Fall. Yeah, you're smart enough to decipher America Ferreira's speech, but can you translate this? If Barbie was so easy, I want a line-by-line -line analysis of this argument on my desk Monday morning. Your generosity conceals something dirtier and meaner. I think what she's saying is, oh, husband's a little mean. Probably why Get On Your Knees absolutely floored me when Jacqueline Novak said such things as, You thought there were holes in my argument? Perhaps some of you do as well. I hope you do, because don't you know I know there are? I put those there on purpose. Just something about a woman refusing to take the L. Somehow I win again. So Sandra's complicated. She's cold-hearted. She's icy. According to Samwell in this one particular recording. Cold-hearted. You're a monster. My wife is a bitch and I don't like her. But why take his words at face value? I mean, there's clearly some ulterior motive that he didn't disclose to her. What Samwell calls coldness and iciness perhaps isn't because Sandra actually embodies those traits, but because she lacks the warmth we typically expect of women, especially mothers. We don't accept it structurally, and we don't accept it spiritually. She may not be a bitch, but she's self-assured, and sometimes that can be equally as alarming. Likewise, Sandra is criticized by the public watching the trial unfold for having a murky personality. Le, la personnalité trouble de son avoiteur, son côté but is it actually a murky personality or is it just this lack of warmth? And maybe the public watching would have more easily accepted Sandra as an atypical woman and by extension us, the audience watching this film, if she was accepted in her relationship. Like women who don't meet our societal expectations of them get a pardon if they exist in a functional heteronormative relationship. If all that weirdness is contained in a closed ecosystem. But based on this, again, one recording, Samwell doesn't seem to accept her. So why would we? But I invite you to consider that perhaps every point that Samwell brings up in this conversation could be interpreted as him projecting his own insecurities onto Sandra. Has it all just got to do with how he sees himself, hmm? And this may be the kicker, how she imposes nothing on him, despite him asserting the opposite. If I imposed on you what you're imposing on me, neither of us would be able to write. You impose your solutions. I believe that it's a lack of imposing that really frustrates him. Let me explain. For the most recent part of their life together, Sandra's been the one following his lead and his behavior. Physically and mentally, she agreed to move back to his hometown, a home that could accommodate an Airbnb type space once Samuel finished the renovation. In addition to the renovation, he's also chosen to homeschool Daniel and continue teaching classes. And also somewhere in there, he wants to do his own writing. So that's like the mental space. And then in terms of like the physical space of the home that they share together, he's the one with the home office. Sandra works from bed. When the prosecution questions her on all this, she says, yeah, I can work from anywhere. Le volume assourdissant à un mètre au-dessus de votre tête. C'est pas anodin, non? J'ai l'habitude, ça me dérange pas. Je peux travailler dans n'importe quel environnement, dans n'importe quel état. But the unspoken thing is that she's had to because of him. She's been married to him. She knows that he needs the time and space to do things his own way. External factors don't really affect her and her getting her work done. If I imposed on you what you're imposing on me, neither of us would be able to write. Don't worry about me, I'll always manage to write. Don't worry about me, I'll always manage to write. And she means it because she does. No matter what environment he puts her in. This unfinished ski chalet with sawdust presumably going everywhere and 
blasting the same song hours and hours on end. She just wrote her next book. So she's conceded in these areas, but in the recording, he takes all these things I've mentioned and makes it as if they're impositions from her. I want this time back, and you owe it to me. Do I force you to teach? Do I force you to homeschool Daniel? Stop whining about your scheduling bullshit and drop this logic which comes down to casting blame on me for what you did or didn't do. And she's able to easily dismantle these arguments because she knows that she's not the issue. She recognizes this behavior. She's been married to him. It's all about his own self-doubts, which create a toxic relationship with work and perception of time in terms of being able to get things done. During the trial, Vincent characterizes Samwell as a project man. He had abandoned his previous novel even when Sandra encouraged him that the idea was great. He's taking a long time in renovating the attic. Did you ever take some risk when he was working? No, he was very cautious and meticulous. He worked slowly. Because he's probably a perfectionist, he gets bogged down by having to actually execute an idea that the finished project might not meet his expectations from the start, making it easier to stall the whole thing than to see it through imperfectly. Sandra hasn't imposed anything on him. She let him take the lead on this new chapter of their lives together. But that just means that now he's fully accountable for his own time, which terrifies him. When he argues that she's the imposing one, I hear a man saying, you're imposing a freedom on me that I don't know what to do with. It reminds me of that normal people quote, generally I find men are a lot more concerned with limiting the freedom of women than exercising personal freedom for themselves. When Samuel says you impose your solutions, I also hear a man saying you aren't offering a solution for me. Because in addition to giving him the space to take control of his life, even if that means failing, she refuses to coddle him. I want time to start writing again. Great, go for it. Great do it. Because to her, when you want to do something, you just do it. That's the way she operates. She is about pushing forward despite the circumstances because of this very relationship. All this time spent chit-chatting could be spent in silence doing whatever you want to do. We also see this sort of persistence come up after Samwell's death when she's encouraging Daniel to get out of bed. It's daytime. You need to get up. Honey, I know this is hard. It's hard for me too. But we have to try and do the things that we did before. She values doing things over waiting to feel out when it is the right moment to do them. And yeah, maybe asking her son to function like a normal person shortly after his father's death is a bit of a cold ask, but does that mean she's a murderer? I also wonder how much gender plays a part in all this. Assuming they're not living in a vacuum, I'm sure it's a factor. It's not something that the movie really delves into explicitly. Consider how Samuel and Sandra both subvert typical gender expectations in their marriage. Samuel's day-to-day -day consists of homeschooling Daniel, doing projects around the house, and getting groceries. He's the stay-at-home parent. He's the stay-at-home mom a role normally expected of the woman. Sandra is not as close with her son and she's had more success in her career than her husband. I'm not saying these things are good or bad, I'm just saying there's probably a psychological burden to fulfill a particular role in a marriage since there has been a psychological burden to fulfill a particular role in a marriage for most of human history. Most of the time it's been expected we do these particular things and then like 10 years ago people were like wait, what if like, what if we pumped the jam a little bit? Perhaps Samwell views things through this lens, even if subconsciously. It's like another thing to feed the fire of insecurity. He feels like he should be the sole breadwinner of the family, but he's not. That's Sandra, she's had more success with her writing. Perhaps he feels like he should be the protector of the family, but in Sandra's own self-sufficient tendencies, she doesn't need that. She doesn't ask that of him. And then their son's accident has maybe made him feel like he's failed Daniel already in this regard. And even Sandra, who's confident in her own way, isn't immune to what people think of her and her disposition. I I have to accept that we live in your hometown. The people that you grew up with, they look down on me whenever I don't make the effort to smile at them. She's not about going out of her own way against her own habits and inclinations to make other people more comfortable. She's not a people pleaser as women are often conditioned to be. So Samwell having to do things on his own and failing is all the more suffocating in the wake of a woman like Sandra who refuses to exist solely in service to him. She's not behaving as the joting, dutiful wife. You never smile at anyone. That's why you love me, right? If you want to have some stupid bitch who grins at your friends at the ski lobes, you'd have picked someone else. Maybe the failing wouldn't feel so bad if he was with someone who was more nurturing and who would guide him and who would mother him. But it's a vicious cycle to have to admit you need things. That would be too emasculating. So instead of facing himself truthfully, he's turned to this recording, this conversation, and tried to turn her own unconventional nature against her, reframing his insecurities as flaws in her character. But even in saying all this, like, I have to acknowledge that this is a likely instigated argument that's bringing their deepest, darkest insecurities to the surface. And is your darkest insecurity your reality? Hopefully not. I hope that not. 
not for you. Your insecurities should just be the thing that snap you out of a daydream every once in a while. I need to learn how to mix audio. After the recording is finished, there's this weird stillness in the room and it's like everybody knows they've just been privy to perhaps the worst moment in this couple's life together and you just have to proceed with questioning. But Sandra asserts that these issues they brought up didn't mean a ton in their everyday life together. Sometimes when we fought, he brought it up, but he didn't think about it all the time. And I believe her. I believe her when she says she isn't normally a violent person because would a violent person bounce up the stairs like this after her husband just ruined an interview? Interview. Does this gate give the impression of impending destruction? No! That's how I go up the stairs when I'm about to move over my laundry. If every day you were in a relationship with someone you nitpicked and complained about the things you were unhappy about, but the end goal wasn't to not be in that relationship anymore, you would go a crazy! And we know this is something Sandra understands because at the start of the conversation she argues against this behavior. Come on, let's not start taking inventory here, please. I'm not, you're the one nitpicking. And then later, before things get really explosive, she emphasizes emphasizes the thing that negates the nitpicking for her in the first place. I love you. Your father was my soulmate. Chose each other and I loved him. She chose this relationship. She chose to be with this complicated person. She just took him as he was and moved on. And if there's one thing we've learned about Sandra, it's that she can accept a situation and move on. She isn't one to dwell. She's not a dweller. When Vincent comes over to examine the house after Samuel's death, she doesn't even know how to start explaining things. Where do you want to start? Sh should I explain uh, something? Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, this is where we come on. <laughs> this is where we eat. She's so uncomfortable. It's like once they were living the way they were together and she had accepted it, it became beyond explanation. So she's just totally out of practice. This isn't her realm at all. Yeah, it could be said that she's like cagey and elusive. I think she's just someone who's not used to talking about herself casually. Like how at the beginning of the movie she's the one being interviewed and she's still trying to get some of the attention off herself. What interests you? What makes you so mad you want to explore it? Anatomy of a Fall is about reality, but when you scrutinize a specific point of reality in order to gain the full truth, it can actually have the opposite effect, as in it gets further from the truth because when you take a moment and try to stretch it to the entirety of reality, you have to impose your own beliefs to fill in the gaps. And also whatever version of reality you come up with is never going to fully resonate with the people who were actually inside it. I'm not that monster, you know? Well, like, I have my interpretation of this movie in favor of Sandra, you could say. I've negated some things that we've learned about her in the film in order to make my own argument. The things I negated just, like, weren't that interesting to me. I know that she cheated on him, and that's bad. That is definitely bad. But I, I, I feel like there's just so much more juicy, interesting information elsewhere. The cheating conversation is over once you acknowledge it, because it's like, yeah, that was a bad thing to do. I just don't want to talk about it. Like, there's nothing more to be said. Sandra's not perfect, okay? I'm still Team Sandra. But like, what does it mean that she says his generosity conceals something dirtier and meaner? There's more juice there, there's more meat, there's more things to think about. I find it more interesting that this movie presents a couple who has very different views of time and expectations. Like, at the beginning of the movie when she's being interviewed says time is not an issue, and then the fight the day before, Samwell is only talking about time. I need time. I'm talking about blocking out time for myself for the whole year. It's not my time, it's yours! Too much time. I want this time back. Unfortunately for Sandra, the courtroom drama part of this courtroom drama movie is going to force us to put them each in boxes. Can you imagine the moment that she, the one against nitpicking, realizes that a court of law is going to intensely analyze all the intimate little details of her life and do so extremely publicly? At the beginning of the film, before anything's gone to trial, we see this image of Samwell flipping off the camera and sorry to be crass. I don't know how else to put this, but I feel like we see that image here because that's how Sandra feels about him in that moment, that he is flipping her off from his grave. I left my shithole in Germany and ended up stuck here in his shithole. We have to put these things in boxes. Oh, he was the main caretaker of her child. Put it in the guilty pile. She plays piano with her son. Tender. Innocent. He made her move back to his home country. Guilty. He was unable to finish projects due to his own crushing expectations. Innocent. She didn't smile at people. Guilty. So in order to make sense of this film, the final component that's going to tie everything together is characterizing Daniel. Just kidding, we're not characterizing Daniel, you silly billy. You leave Daniel out of the game here. This is not about Daniel. Daniel is not to be interpreted. He is the one who interprets. After the fall, Daniel is dealing with grief and shock, and in the chaos of that, a desire to understand what happened. Personne, uh, 
On peut pas comprendre. Moi, je dois comprendre. When the judge wants to forbid him from listening to all the testimonies, thinking it will be too difficult for him, he advocates for himself to be there on the basis of needing to know all the facts. It's shortly after this that he learns about his father's previous suicide attempt. Daniel doesn't know how to make sense of all this information that he desperately wanted. So, he goes to a legally appointed neutral territory court monitor Marge for help. See, look, this is Marge. Look, look how neutral she is. They call her neutral Marge in these parts. Pour sortir du doute, on est parfois obligé de décider de basculer d'un côté plutôt que d'un autre. Tu dois choisir. Je fais comment là Là, ce que tu me dis, c'est que je dois, je dois faire son blanc. Ah non Non, moi, je dis décider. C'est pas la même chose. Marge really said, pick what is true for you. Choose your reality. He mulls it over in the weekend before his final testimony, and there's this moody shot of him playing Chopin at the piano, which inadvertently tells us his decision. That same song came up earlier in the film when Sandra sat with him shortly after the fall. Showcasing the song again in this moment perhaps suggests that Daniel is choosing to believe in the tender moment with his mom over whatever persona the prosecution and the media are presenting of her. I also like when he's making his final decision on everything, he's looking at the photos. We know photos are limited in capturing a single point in reality from the past, but that doesn't mean there isn't some amount of truth in them. And there's this very quick moment where we see him tap the picture of his mom laughing at Samuel, like, oh, this is the answer I'm looking for. This is the reality I choose to believe in. Like us, watching this movie. We see what we look for. We are all Daniel. And as if using this photo as evidence in the case he wants to make, he comes to understand what happened not by what is more definitive, but by what casts less doubt. Si j'imagine ma mère qui fait ça, je comprends pas. Or si j'imagine mon père, bah là, je, je crois que je peux comprendre. And then in the final testimony, when questioned by the prosecution on these new details and revelations, he stands strong. Earlier in the film, when Daniel was at the stand, the camera was going back and forth like a tennis match, perhaps showing that he is considering both sides of this case and he doesn't know what to think. Now here, he has decided, and the camera's straightforward angle reflects this. Soon after, Sandra is acquitted. Je crois qu'il y a eu trop de mots dans ce procès et j'ai... J'ai plus rien à dire. Too many words, too many words. She is nothing if not consistent. Of course, this is going to be the one thing she says when she has the opportunity to speak to the public. She is against nitpicking, she is against dissecting, and dare I say, she is against anatomizing. Vous êtes soulagé par ce verdict? Je tiens surtout à saluer la clairvoyance du jury qui a vu ensemble un auteur ce qu'elle a toujours été. As she is. Seeing her as she is. Not a monster for not smiling or having an endless vat of warmth for others, but just as a woman who behaved unconventionally because that was really what was on trial here. A person, a character who doesn't meet our internalized expectations and how we reckon with that. So by way of the jury's decision, the public within the film are dealt a conclusion in this case. But as the audience watching, especially with the understated ending, how do we decide what happened? Um, isn't it obvious? We listen to the words of legally appointed neutral territory court monitor March. No, moi je dis décider. Because like Daniel is a witness to this case, we are a witness to this movie, and like him, we have to decide. That's the only way we can come to a conclusion is we have to choose Choose what we believe happened and then stick with it. Brave the consequences of that choice. Choosing to believe in the story that resonates more. Perhaps influenced by what values we impose on these characters. You could see Sandra as the spiteful wife and Samuel ruining the interview on the morning of his death as the final straw in a long chain of events culminating in her killing him out of spite and resentment. Or, or you could see her as just a woman. I've given my interpretation the version of Sandra that resonates more with my reality and how I come to understand a wayward female character existing in a world still desperate for normalcy. But even so, I know that I might not have convinced you. Perhaps I can never convince you. You could take everything I've said about this film and just chalk it up as me misreading the entire thing, and that's okay. Because you don't need to see things exactly how I see them in my reality, in the same way I don't need to see them exactly as they appear in yours. It'd be great if we could find a compromise when it really matters and is important, but we can coexist and disagree. Two things can be true. I mean, in reality, reality isn't just two things between me and you, but just, you know, blobs of existence swimming in the public pool that is our universe. But if I could just try to convince you one last time. In the second to last scene, Sandra is home after being acquitted and greets Daniel. They both talk about how they were afraid of her finally coming home and like, of course, their life has been forever changed by this event and this process. And mom coming home after all this just means they now must take the next step in their new reality together and that's kind of scary. But when Daniel goes to hug her, he kisses her several times on the head. Now, why would he behave so tenderly if he thought his mom was a murderer? Hmm? And, and, 
In the final scene, it would appear as if Sandra is about to go to bed, but she doesn't do that. She goes into Samwell's office. Now, why does that matter? Because it tells us that Sandra is exactly who she says she is. She is consistent. She is habitual. When the prosecution was questioning her about her and Samwell's life together, and he was like, wow, you really go to your husband's office every night and sleep there for a little bit before going to your own bedroom? And she was like, yeah, like, this is what we did. We had separate bedroom spaces, but we were still very close. She wasn't lying. She still goes to his office before she goes to her own bed. Even when Samwell isn't there, because this is what she's always done. The issues in this film were never about anything she did, but always about how we perceived it. And then the final, final thing is that Snoop lies with her too. Samwell and Snoop, we know from Daniel's final testimony, are sort of connected figures. They are both guardians of Daniel in a way, their main functions being in service to him. So Snoop lying with Sandra at the end could just be normal behavior. I mean, he's a dog. Or it could be showing that it's like the spirit of Samwell lying with her too. And this is the end of the movie. This is what the filmmakers wanted us to end on. We see a woman who had to go through this process because of this event. And then at the end of it all, she's just a woman grieving. She's just been a woman grieving this whole time. This is the final image of the film. Can you believe the twist is that the main character was just exactly who she said she was the entire time? But no, I know, I could never convince you if it were up to my dad, this movie would end like Basic Instinct 1992. The murder weapon that was previously never discovered is like found underneath Sandra's bed or something. And then we're like, oh, well, she, she didn't. That's crazy. That prosecution guy was so annoying. I didn't want him to be right. That's my dad's perfect version of Anatomy of a Fall. And I can't take that away from him. That's the story he wanted to see. And then my mom was like, no, that's too Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to try to explain him out of his desired film reality. Movies are fun. We're having fun. Movies can guide us to conclusions, can frame things a certain way, but in my opinion, a good movie is never going to lie to us. And if I may, it's not called Anatomy of a Push or Anatomy of a Shove. It's called Anatomy of a Fall. It's in the title.